How in the Straight to Video have we not taken a deep dive into Charles Band and his Full Moon universe? I'm not talking about Empire Pictures either, as we have discussed Reanimator at length, as well as fun smaller flicks like Dolls. Empire went away, but soon after we were gifted Full Moon Features, which has been one of those gifts that keeps on giving. Lance wrote his love letter to the studio last August, talking about some of his favorites and the company as a whole, but somehow we've avoided looking at any of their bigger series like Puppet Master, Subspecies, Trancers, which was a survivor from Empire, or even Evil Bong. Today that changes. Today we're going to defend a movie from arguably their most recognizable series. Puppet Master 4 deserves a second look. Puppet Master is to Full Moon as Nightmare on Elm Street is to New Line Cinema. In the same way that New Line is the house that Freddy built, Full Moon was built up by a rogue group of murderous little puppets. While Full Moon has changed its name slightly over the years and moved on to other franchises, Puppet Master remains its most endearing and longest running, with a staggering 15 films to its name. The first entry doesn't quite hold up as well as it would like to be remembered, and there are definitely some stinkers scattered throughout the series, but when it's good, it's a hell of a lot of fun. Even when it misses the mark, it has the ability to deliver on some fun aspects that we all look for in any straight-to-video horror flick. Part 2 and 3 stood out from the first one and kept upping the ante on gore and introducing new puppets. Part 3 in particular is easily the fan favorite, yell at me in the comments if I'm wrong, but I wanted to give 4 some love. It undoubtedly has its flaws. 4 and 5 were originally supposed to be one long movie directed by Band himself that would have been the grand return to theatrical releases, but that fell through and Journeyman director Jeff Burr was brought in to direct both entries. Burr has done a lot in the horror realm, and as a channel we've actually talked about more of his movies than anything at a full moon. Burr directed the criminally underrated, mean-spirited anthology flick From a Whisper to a Scream, Better Than It Should Be sequel Stepfather 2, and What Could Have Been with Texas Chainsaw 3, all of which we've discussed here. Now with your four Pete, Mr. Burr, we salute you. Watching 4 and 5 back to back is the best way to enjoy them, but with 5 taking the tried and true method of showing off way too much footage from previous films, I wanted to spotlight 4. The two movies also have 5 combined writers, which traditionally is a big ol' red flag. While the writing is nothing to teach in a screenwriting class, it's not terrible either, and makes sense when you remember that the movies were originally intended as one, so they almost certainly added people to give enough plot points for two movies. Once it was decided that the movie was split into two, an older story idea was brought in called Decapitron. It's exactly what you think it is, and it was moved over from what would have been Empire Pictures' largest budgeted film to date before the studio went under. Why am I defending this movie then? Well, it's got the courage to try things that its slasher and series contemporaries never would, and has that 90s charm that just doesn't get duplicated anymore. The movie opens in hell, with the demon Sutek complaining about the Upworld, and yes, it's okay to ask, what's Upworld? He's angry that Andre Toulon, who we know as a puppet master, stole the power that enables him to give life to the puppets. He sends his minions through a portal in the form of totem puppets that look like roided up versions of the Zuni fetish dolls from Trilogy of Terror 1 and 2. They attack a scientist who is doing incredibly vague sciencey stuff, and this is where we get our first puppet master magic. I know it can look a little cheesy at times, but the stop motion effects that enable the puppets to do their thing is one of the reasons we watch these movies in the first place. Leslie looks like someone that would be our main protagonist, but quickly loses a finger followed by her life when she is possessed by the first of the totems. We switch over to Rick Myers, who is actually the main hero of our film. He's a boy genius scientist working on a special AI and is staying at the famous Bodega Bay to work in isolation. Let's get ready to rumble! Rick plays laser tag in the name of science and is joined by his friends Susie, Lauren, and Cameron. Well, Cameron's a dick, but the other two are nice, including Lauren, who has psychic abilities and finds Blade in the infamous trunk, where the group finds interesting looking vials and other dolls, along with Toulon's notebook. They use these files to wake up the dolls, and good lord, Six Shooter needs to shut the hell up. Uh, 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 uh. 
he has a laugh that is non-stop and super annoying. While the other puppets emote, none of them make you want to mute the movie quite like his drawl of a laugh. Sutek gets pissed that the other puppets are awake and tells his minions to kill everyone there. Rick does the most logical thing and plays laser tag with his newly animated friends, and at this point I'm sure you're noticing something strange about the puppets in this movie. They aren't violently murdering everything and everyone in sight. This movie makes the puppets good guys, which is what I alluded to earlier with them doing something new and different. None of the other big slasher or monster series make their main villains good. You have to go back to the days of the Universal Monsters or when Godzilla would switch back and forth to find that sort of turn. While the movie is dull at points and could use a higher body count and more gore, it gets points for making the puppets heroes. While they have always been more entertaining as the murderous bad guys in the series, if the idea was utilized better, this could have been a blast to watch. As it is though, they only kill the totems sent from hell to stop everyone and even then, they aren't utilized like they should be. Six Shooter doesn't go around blasting anyone, Blade keeps his knives to himself, and no killer leeches in sight. Pinhead gets to be rough and tumble at points, but that's pretty much the extent of it. A seance occurs to try to get Toulon to explain himself, but Lauren gets used as the wrong vessel, and it goes south for our heroes. Well, Cameron isn't a hero, but you get what I'm saying. The totems bust through, and the gang decides to split with our resident D-bag also trying to take the formula in tow. You know, I haven't really discussed the cast much, but it's not because they're doing a bad job per se, there's just really nobody here that stands out, nor is there a hidden Jeffrey Combs or Lance Henriksen strewn about. Gordon Curie, who plays our male lead, has shown up in a ton of TV as well as being miles from Jason Takes Manhattan. Chandra West, who played Susie, also floated around smaller genre fare and had a 7 episode run on the short-lived HBO show John from Cincinnati. Finally, there is Guy Rolf, who played Toulon in Puppet Master 3, 4, 5, and Retro Puppet Master. Allegedly, he wouldn't work on this movie and the next one until producer Charles Band slid an envelope of money under his hotel room door. He was a classic era actor who appeared in tons of noir and classical fare before switching exclusively to horror output from the mid 80s until his death. While we talked about the director Burr, the five writers somehow, miraculously, all only have this and its direct sequel to their writing credits. This also should be only one credit as the longer film was turned into a two-parter. The totems kill Cameron while he tries to escape in a car, and our resident psychic Lauren begins to channel Toulon while the fan favorite trio of Blade, Pinhead, and Tunneler take out one of the totems. It's the type of stuff that the fans look for in these movies, and the effects deliver pretty well. I especially like how the demons in hell that are using the totems as vessels melt away, even if they are just guys in lousy rubber suits. The puppets attempt to resurrect Decapitron in the style of Frankenstein's monster, complete with lightning bolt powered machine, and we get the awesome effect of human hands standing in for Pinhead. Gotta love it. They fry one of the totems before Guy Rolf earns his envelope of money by wearing a turtleneck and seemingly doing his lines while laying in bed, before getting green screened into a puppet's body. They turn the puppet into Decapitron, while Susie and Lauren escape from one of the totems by throwing acid on it. Blade buys time and also takes a beating, but then Decapitron steps in and, well, he doesn't decapitate him, which is a little bit strange and a lot bit disappointing. <laughs> Sutek is defeated for now, and Rick is the new puppet master, at least for the next movie. It's nearly impossible to separate 4 and 5 as they feel like one movie, and should have been, but 4 is unfairly ridiculed simply for having to follow 3. 5 is fine, but repeats so much of what happens in 4 that it's far less entertaining. It doesn't quite go into full-on usage of older movies like Puppet Master Legacy does, but it needlessly retreads the exact same ground that the most recent film did. Ban and his crew of writers and directors know what they're doing with each and every film they put out. He's a hell of a businessman, but also has a passion for all things movies, and hates that they can't get made the same way that they used to when he started out. Puppet Master 4 does a lot of fun things that aren't included in the other movies, and that should keep it in the rotation when watching the whole series. While there are some real misses, like the characters being forgettable, a severe lack of gore and body count, and it feeling incomplete as a whole, it does some great things there too. Thinking outside the box, or trunk as it were here, and making the puppets instruments for good is something you just don't see in other horror series. 
Sure, it didn't last more than a couple movies as the timeline and main characters continued to change, but it was unexpected, and the series needed to change after the third film closed out the original run with too long. The series is all over the place in terms of quality, and some of the entries are worse than others, but 4 deserves a chance. It's got that 90s direct-to-video flair that is sorely missed now, and is a fun time with some of our favorite menacing puppets. You always kind of root for them, but here it's actually justified, and the good guys actually win.